Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. I'm your host, Dave Marshall, and this is the second part of a two-part episode with Dr. Marissa Betts of the University of New England on small Shelley fossils. In the first part of this episode, we'd been discussing the different types of data that are used to inform the geological timescale, and now in this second part, we'll be discussing some of the key organisms used for biostratigraphy in this period. And if you're uncertain about what any of that means, then I definitely suggest listening to part one of the interview first. At the time of the release of this part, I'm scheduled to be doing commercial biostratigraphy on an oil rig somewhere in the middle of the North Sea. The principles of biostratigraphy for oil exploration are very much the same as for constructing geological timescales, just that the periods and organisms used for both can be very different. So using fossils as tools for dating sediments is hugely important, and as we discussed in episode 81, have even been used to convict murderers. As we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you can follow all of Marissa's work via her Instagram account at 200micron. That's at the number 200 and the word micron. And whilst you're on social media, you can also follow us too. Likes and shares of any of our content will always be appreciated. And please feel free to send us your comments and episode requests by posts, direct messages, or email to info at paleocast.com. Finally, you've got to stick around until the very, very end of this episode to hear when Marissa and I both got totally freaked out by our first ever paranormal experience here on Paleocast. We hope you enjoy this episode. Let's turn our attention now to the biostratigraphy. We're, we're paleocast, we should be talking about fossils. So uh, we've mentioned trilobites, uh, but which other groups could be used to uh, correlate these rocks and different events and whatnot? Yeah, so before the incoming of trilobites in South Australia, there's a whole diversity of other shelly fossils. Um, and their major groups are the tomotids, um, but also brachiopods, mollusks, and some other arthropods like bradorids. Right, let's talk about tomotids. What are they? <laughs> no one's ever heard of them. <laughs> that surely is not true. Um well, tomotids, uh, I guess you could call them small shelly fossils. That's another uh, common way to um, talk about these sort of uh, little tiny fossils in the early Cambrian. I guess we're realising more and more that it's uh, just an umbrella term or a wastebasket term for a whole suite of different kinds of organisms. Um, and a lot of them are multi-element animals, so that means that they had uh, – lots of different um, parts to their skeleton. So talking about tiny little, the, each, each little um, sclerite or piece of their suit of armour would be under a millimetre and um, these things would come together to create their whole suit of armour, which is called sclerotome, and then these things fall apart after they die. So the whole process for us is to like do a very tiny little puzzle and to put these little things back together. So the Tomotids is kind of this big group of what is probably a, a mishmash of lots of different things. And so for several decades, a lot of the work has been about trying to disentangle this um, problem and do these little tiny shelly puzzles to work out what we're dealing with. So your Tomotids are kind of a, a jigsaw puzzle of sclerites. How do you know that they are all from the same sclerotome? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of the life's work of, of many paleontologists. Um, but, yeah, the, uh, one organism can have a whole series of um, sclerites and they might not all necessarily look the same. Um, they might have different morphologies because these things were often like a slug-like creature. So they would have left and right um, bilateral symmetry. And so they can have, um, you know, left and right curving sclerites, for example. Um, 
So their gross morphology might be different, but if we get in closer, we can have a look at the microstructure, how they built the sclerites. We can also have a look at the uh, micro ornamentation on the external surfaces of the sclerites, and that can link them together and tell us that these things were biomineralized by the same kind of organism. Um, but it can take a lot of a lot of work because um, uh, one particular uh, organism might have you know, five or six different types of sclerites associated with it. And have we ever found them complete? Yeah, well, there's um, a good example is, um, or a classic example is something called Halkyria evangelista, which is, um, it, you know, before they found the body fossil, uh, it was only known from its isolated sclerites um, in early Cambrian um, Shelley fossil assemblages. And these are little sort of spine-like shapes or paddle-like shapes. And um, it wasn't until the body fossil was discovered in the Sirius Passet in Greenland um, that they realised that, that all of these different kinds of sclerites actually belonged to uh, a, a flattened worm-like creature um, and it has, it's quite beautiful actually, it has these rows of different types of sclerites down its body and it also has two larger shells, one at the head end and one at the tail end and the head and the tail uh, shells look very similar to brachiopod shells <laughs> And so they had been described separately as a brachiopod. And the other things, well, I don't think people really knew what they were. So that is a, a bit of a poster child for a success story with, uh, with early Cambrian Shelley fossil puzzles. But in South Australia, we have one as well, which is called um, Eccentrotheca helenia. And they'd only been known from very tiny little arc-shaped sclerites. And Glenn and his colleagues discovered the entire sclerotome um, which was sort of articulated together, these things hadn't fallen apart. Just by luck, they had been um, able to stick together during our processing. And this thing actually is a tube. So the sclerites stacked together to make rings and it grew like a, a tube. So it was probably um, attached to something, a sessile organism um, that probably was a filter feeder. Those two different animals sound really different. You've got kind of like a slug-like one and then a, a, a filter feeder. Is there a yeah. lot of diversity in these tomatids? And do we know anything about any of the others? Yeah, um, probably a huge amount of diversity. Um, the small shelly fossils as a general group contains a whole bunch of different types of things. And that, that umbrella group also includes mollusks and... Um, arthropods and things like that. But the Tomotids are sort of um, coming out as these probably um, two different uh, styles, um, the slug-like kind of vagrant things, worm-like things that will get around on the seafloor, and then your um, sessile filter-feeding things that are probably on a, a stem group or a, an ancient lineage um, leading to the brachiopods. Does it matter that we don't know what they are fully um, for, in terms well, of biostratigraphy? Well, yeah, okay, yeah. Well, it, it does if you're interested in, you know, early evolution and things like that. Um, but in terms of biostratigraphy, not necessarily so much. I mean, it, we, we, you just need to be able to establish that they have um, predictable and repeatable stratigraphic ranges and occurrences. And that, that is the most important thing for applying them to any kind of biostratigraphic work. Okay, uh, some of the other groups that you have mentioned, uh, brachiopods, mm -hmm. are they worth talking about? <laughs> or are they just brachiopods? They kind of do well, the same thing throughout history. Yeah, doing the, the, yeah the, bracks, the bracks are cool. Like some people, you know, they love their bracks. I'm not a huge, I'm not like a massive brack girl, but um, they, de they can definitely be helpful. Some of them are like completely unhelpful, like that they're so, they've been so good at dispersing themselves or... They, uh, you know, they, they all look so similar that, um, that they're not really useful for anything that is found everywhere. But some of them definitely have um, uh, useful biostratigraphic ranges, so we can apply them in the same way as we're using the, the Shelley fossils and the Tomotids. You've mentioned a few of the other groups other than Tomotids. Are they better or worse? Which are the best ones to use? 
So, yeah, so there are, we, we've got tomotids, um, bracts, mollusks and other things um, that we're using for biostrat. Um, and definitely there are some groups that are more useful than others. Um, and it basically comes down to how they built their skeletons and what they used to build them with. Um, the tomotids and a lot of the tomotids um, and a lot of the bracts as well were building their um, their skeletons out of uh, calcium phosphate. Calcium phosphate is um, what our bones and teeth are made out of as well, um, as opposed to a group like mollusks um, that will build their shells out of calcium carbonate. And the critical difference here, or the um, the why that's important, is because when we are extracting the shelly fossils out of the limestones, we use an acid bath. And this is a pretty standard technique for dealing with microfossils is to acid leach them. And so we whack our limestones into a bath of acid, which is just, it's just vinegar, kind of strong vinegar, and it dissolves the rock away, but it leaves the fossils behind. And so if the fossils are made from calcium carbonate and they haven't been um, replaced by anything, then they just get dissolved. And so there is a, a very strong taphonomic and observational bias with, with mollusks. Um, and so it makes it very difficult then to apply them for biostratigraphic work because we can't really trust their, their first and last appearances. So their occurrences in our section might not necessarily be about whether they were existing at that particular time. It was just about whether they got preserved at that particular point. And can that be useful for correlation? For bi no. Well, I think that the, the mollusks have been used a lot. They do get used a lot and um, they can be useful. Um, but as long as you kind of quantify or have some kind of handle on how they're being preserved. So um, uh, my my mate, uh, Sarah Jacke, who did my her PhD with me in Glenn's lab, she um, just published a paper dealing with this exact problem. So she, and we, when we were going through our PhDs, we were always like, what the hell? You know, like these mollusks, we only ever see them you know, when, when they come in in a horizon in our sections, you know, you don't just get one or two, you get hundreds of them, you know. And so we were like, what's going on here? And so she did sort of a deep dive into, you know, shelly fossil, um, but particularly mollusk taphonomy and how they're being preserved. And the sort of upshot was that if they're not getting phosphatized or infilled with phosphate, We'll never see them. Another group you mentioned was the Bradorids. So what were they? What what's what's the deal? Oh, I love Bradorids. I think that well, I think I love Bradorids so much because um, I dealt with them a lot during my honors project. So I, just, I had one year where I where I looked at a, one particular section and I had lots of them in my um, shelly fossil residues that came out of those acid baths. And um, I actually had a number of new species, so I got to really get involved with their systematics and taxonomy. And so I got my head full of Bradorids and I think I just love them as a consequence. But these things are, um, <laughs> these things are uh, very tiny little bivalved arthropods. So if you can imagine um, uh, an ancient prawn-like organism, there's lots of uh, appendages, and those appendages and its soft parts were protected by two shields that folded down along its back and enclosed the body to, to sort of protect it inside. Um, they are morphologically very similar to ostracods, um, which take off well, the Bradorids really are only found in the Cambrian and ostracods take off from the Ordovician and have this enormous um, uh, fossil record that goes from the Ordovician all the way to the present day. But the Bradorids are really only um, restricted to the Cambrian. How useful were the Bradorids in constructing this biostratigraphic scheme? 
Yeah, so um, once we really started to get into the data and look at all of the stratigraphic ranges of these different fauna, it was becoming apparent that the Bredorids, we have like a, a lot, there's a, um, quite an abundant f fauna in South Australia, and it was uh, becoming apparent that they did have some pretty strong biostratigraphic signals. And so we have assemblages that are, you know, uh, give us an indication of a particular age, which is important for our a regional sort of scheme. But um, as we kept going with them, um, we realised that we, particularly in our younger uh, zone and the younger material we were looking at, the Bredorids um, have a lot of similarities to um, Bredorids in uh, China, South China in particular. So a lot of the genera that we see um, in South Australia are the same genera as we, we see in South China. So we have a lot of South Chinese names sort of popping up in the Redora taxa, but different species names. So we have Chinese genera in Australia, but they're, they're just slightly different species. And are there any other groups that we've not spoken about yet? Uh, for Biostrat in the Cambrian, yeah, there's um, uh, a group called the Archaeocyas, which um, are often utilised. Um, we, firstly, Archaeocyas are a um, ancient sponge-like organism, so they did a very similar thing to modern sponges. They um, were probably filter feeders, and they had like a, a root-like holdfast that could um, anchor them to the substrate. And they they built, they're very beautiful fossils actually, they built the very first animal built reefs. Um, and so they uh, accumulated one on top of the other and ended up making quite large buildups actually. Um, that can be, uh, one I studied um, in the Flinders was at least 100 metres in diameter and it had relief, right? So you had to sort of hike up and over it. And it's all built from Archaeocyas. And um, they created really cool sort of niches for other shelly fossils to live in. So they were really um, important ecosystem engineers in the um, early Cambrian. Um, unfortunately, their taxonomy, um, uh, they're very much oversplit, I think. Um, and... Um, they're probably ecophenotypic as well, which means that, you know, the, they, their morphology will change depending on the kind of environment they were living in. Modern corals do this. So in, in modern reef situations, you can get an acropora coral, which is one of those branching sort of finger-like corals that in very calm water, those branches are able to grow very long and spindly. But in high energy conditions with waves and stuff, they're real stubby looking. But it's the same thing. They're just growing in different places. So archaeos, they probably were like this. And that those differences in morphology has probably translated into these different um, uh, morphologies being described as different species. So that in that respect, they're probably oversplit. And because of the sort of poor handle on their taxonomy, they're not great biostratigraphic tools. It's very difficult to apply them to any kind of rigorous biostratigraphic work when you have a very little handle on um, how the taxonomy actually works. So we, we steered clear of archaeocyas in our work. If we start looking at some conclusions now, were you able to establish any relationship between the biostratigraphic and chemostratigraphic events? Yeah, um, so that was something that we did see after we started to really get to grips with the uh, isotopic work, was that um, in section after section, we were seeing the same sort of um, relationship between our zones. So the a boundary between two zones would be um, correlated with a particular carbon isotope event, positive um, carbon isotope values, for example. Um, and so the knock-on effect for this um, in particular in, in our sections was um, the appearance of trilobites. So in, um, in the global scheme, there is a positive carbon isotope excursion called um, the Cambrian Arthropod Radiation Event, which is abbreviated to the CARE, um, and that's associated with um, the appearance of trilobites. And... 
um, in our sections, we were seeing that and uh, that positive event um, quite close to the occurrence of trilobites bites in our sections. And that clashed with the previous ideas that had been floating around um, in the literature prior, which was that trilobites in Australia came came um, or first appeared much later in than they did elsewhere in the world. And so what our our project did, what our data did, was really pull that first appearance down um, quite a bit um, and more in line with the first occurrences of trilobites elsewhere in the world. So that was a really important um, uh, outcome for for our work. Can you ever infer or be certain of any causality? So we know that um, there's an appearance of trilobites and we know that there's this isotope excursion. How do we know that they aren't just occurring at the same time? Can, can we say that the appearance of trilobites is causing this isotope excursion? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not sure. Like there, but it it's it does seem to be correlated, not necessarily just with the appearance of trilobites, but it's an arthropod thing. So, um, bradorids are part of that um, radiation event as well, and um, it's pretty standard to see arthropods, uh, uh, bradorids come in before trilobites, um, pretty much everywhere. Um, and then you have the the positive excursion associated with it. Um, but yeah, I, it, whether it's the exact cause, it's very difficult to say. There is another carbon isotope um, excursion um, called the AECE, which is the Archaeocyath Extinction Carbon Isotope. A lot of them have very silly acronyms, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the the Archaeo one, the extinct, it's meant to be an extinction. But it's not really. It's called the extinction, but actually, it's just a sort of um, the diversity sort of drops. So often, you can get the AECE and still have Archaeocyas in your section. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But I didn't make the acronyms, you know. <laughs> oh, it sounds complicated. It sounds oh, yeah. like a lot of work. <laughs> On the whole, did all of these biological and geochemical events all coalesce to form a coherent and well-supported scheme? Well, yeah. In the end, it worked out it's like surprisingly well, actually. Like I was, um, you know, the as a PhD student, I think you can be very nervous about your project, right, and the potential outcomes and whether it will be successful or not. Um and I, I was, um, I guess, looking back, I could see that I, how successful it was, and it was really the idea of built like to expand it right from just looking at the biostrat to incorporating the chemostrat as well. And um, we haven't necessarily mentioned, but we also did the uh, radiometric dates, so we do have volcanic horizons. Um, in our sections and so we got some hard numbers on the scheme as well and so they're super critical for being able to sort of pin down parts of the scheme um, and then you can use the sort of relative dating the biostrat and the chemostrat to work around those numbers and so at the end of the day it became a very tight very robust and very well supported um, chronostratigraphic scheme um, that said, like it's the kind of work that will always be um, refined. So going into the future, we'll still be we're still measuring sections. Like I've got material in acid at the moment. We're getting isotopes um, as well. So we're still we will be adding and refining this scheme as we go along. And how does this scheme fit in with everything else that's going on in the rest of the world? Were you able to correlate it? Yeah, so um, I guess that was the that was the critical element for us that turned it into sort of turn it from a regional project or a regional scheme, being able to tie it into a global scheme was super critical, and the um, the isotopes really helped us do that. The, the radiometric dates as well. So um, we what we could do then is put these you know often endemic faunas from South Australia that very beautiful and abundant, uh, well-preserved Shelley fossils of South Australia into a global context. 
Um, and um, I think that we were probably the, the first group to have really done that in a, in a reliable way. Could there ever be a scheme for the earliest Cambrian that works globally everywhere, or will it always be a patchwork of regional schemes? Yeah, I think we're <laughs> we'll probably end up having to deal with this patchwork forever. Um, you know, like I said earlier, the Cambrian is a really special time, right? The um, the the ecosystems and the organisms. Um, are really just sort of starting to get going. And I suppose because of that, diachronism and endemism is um, always going to be our Achilles heel. Um, In the modern day, you know, we have really um, uh, cosmopolitan or globally distributed planktonic um, organisms that are used to do biostratigraphy a really, really fine scale biophotographic work. And we just don't have that in the early Cambrian. And so, yeah, what we have to do is deal with regional systems and regional schemes um, using sometimes endemic fauna, but we're always trying to look for ways to um, integrate them globally. We need some global, global signals to connect it all together. What's next for you um, with this work is that is there anything you can do to refine it or is there anything that you're doing to uh, better tie up all of the different correlations yeah so the um what i love about it is that it's something that will be tightened up tweaked and refined again and again and again as we go into the future and uh i am I've got section. We measured sections last year in the Flinders that will help us um, refine it more. We have only at the moment, you know, targeted uh, a period of time from the Terranuvian stage two to, you know, series two, stages three and four. Um, but what we'd like to do is take that into younger rocks. So we've got uh, sections measured through um, some younger intervals, and so we'll be seeing if we can um, take the uh, take the study into younger material and see what we can do with that. And what do you see as some of the biggest challenges in doing that? Um, the right types of rocks. So in South Australia, um, the package that I was looking at for this project was um, it's a beautiful package of, of limestones, up to five kilometres thickness of limestones, really beautiful um, continuous sections. Uh, we really are spoiled, I think, in, in South Australia for some really nicely preserved Cambrian. Um, there is a point where the carbonate runs out which is unfortunate. And that means that you don't get those shelly fossils preserved and you also can't get the carbon isotopes. So you do get um, other fossils, trilobites um, and siliciclastics, for example. But, yeah, your, your, the window that you need in terms of the fasces, um, that can be a limitation um, that we can't really do much about. You can just sort of you do what you can, I suppose. And personally, what's next for you? Well, um, as, on top of the chronostratigraphic work, um, I I love looking at the um, the fossils themselves, and I have a bunch of different projects on the go at the moment. You've actually caught me in between two big trips. So um, I just got back from NAPC in the US a little while ago, and um, the day after tomorrow, I'm going to Mongolia to do field work in Mongolia um, uh, with some uh, colleagues to look at the Cambrian there. And we are essentially doing a very a very similar style um, approach to the chronostratigraphic work I did in South Australia. So we're measuring sections and looking at the shelly fossils, getting carbon isotopes um, and trying to work out the ages of those rocks there. Right. Well, I think that just about does it. Um, been chatting a long time. So uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. No worries. Thanks for having me. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Soule, Liz Martin-Silverstone and Caitlin Colary. 
It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news. You got a friend. <laughs> Trying to sneak in silently. Who's that? What? What? Are you what? kidding? There was someone in the room. No. No, the, my door is closed. What? There's nobody here. Don't scare me. There's literally nobody here. Uh, no, seriously. Like. What? What? Have I just seen a. Have we just had like a paranormal experience on Paleocast? <laughs> no, there's literally nobody in here. My door is closed. Maybe it's like a shadow because it got quite dark. I'm going to turn the light on. <laughs> um. I thought I thought someone was trying to come past and they saw that you were recording and then they backed off. I saw like No, Dave, do not scare me like that. <laughs> For sure nobody is here. Nobody is here. <laughs> <laughs> You're not recording video, are you? No, I wish I was. Oh no. Like Honestly, I saw I saw someone come into the screen. Uh, if you, you can see your own camera, you see where there's the yeah. white books just on the edge. Yeah. They came in and the arm just came into the thing, no! and then it backed out. And then because it was like that was weird, like, and then there was a shadow on the wall behind, which I thought was them moving past, like a light that was there as well. No, the other side. Oh, I'm yeah. super nervous. Well, I'm thinking, I'm looking at my window because maybe it's it's evening and somebody might have rev- like driven out of the car park and they might have had their headlights on, which has cast a shadow or something in the room. <laughs> all the ac- all the activity was on the left hand side, side as I that side as I look at it. Something came in. And then went out, and then there was a shadow generated from that side. Oh, I don't know. Is there I a light? Know. Is there a light that side? A light source? What, on this side? Yeah. Like, no, the door's closed. No. Nah. Is there a window in the door? No. Nah. Oh. Literally nothing. <laughs> <Oof>. Right. <laughs> it was the ghost of a giant Predorid. Wow, I'm terrified. <laughs> right, calm down. Just think of Archeos. Okay, They're yeah, next. and Fedoras and things. Wow, far out. The light's on now, so no ghosts can get me. Obviously, yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> like when you tuck your feet in the duvet so that you're completely yeah, safe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Um, oh, I could totally be mean now and to- start to freak you out. Just be like, "Oh my god, there's a there's a face." Right. 